planning an event and wondering how you can give your attendees the best experience possible? Take advantage of customized meetings with Hilton that make it easier than ever to incorporate health, wellness, and great breaks. Hilton will help you build an extraordinary meeting that attendees will remember. To book your next meeting or event, go to meetings.hilton.com. Welcome to Gather Geeks, a podcast by BizBash, the place where people passionate about meetings and events come together. Here are your hosts, BizBash CEO David Adler and Editor-in-Chief Beth Kormanick. Hi, David. Hey, Beth. Here we are, another Gather Geeks podcast. Today's guest is Adam Perry of Event Tech Live. Even though he's a self-described early adopter and a geek at heart, this is really an accessible conversation for any event planner. Uh, We will get into the weeds here as well. So this is going to be a really interesting conversation that we have. And we spoke with him in advance of the event, which takes place in London in November. Um, David, one of the key takeaways for me was even... Big brands with huge budgets don't have this figured out. Everyone constantly thinks they're behind. And so the lesson is, at least for me, my takeaway was dive in. You know, no one should be scared away from learning about event tech. Yeah, and event tech is changing every day. But if you don't jump in the pool, you're never going to progress. We're in an era of lightning fast change, as you said, and it's a world where you can register for a conference via a chatbot. Uh, either that's here or it's coming soon. Well, I believe that the purpose of technology is to take what was complex and make it trivial. And that's what we're seeing happening over and over again. And these conferences that, that Adam hosts are really about that, the tools about that. We're going to talk about the hottest areas of event tech for everything from concerts and festivals to trade shows, the best tech for engagement, and why most event planners don't actually have to understand the blockchain. So that's a huge relief, right? Thank God. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Let's take a listen. Adam, welcome to Gather Geeks. Well, thank you very much. So as you are getting ready for Event Tech Live, which is happening in November, what is top of mind for you? right now when it comes to event tech? Ooh, that's, a, that's an interesting one. I, I think um, it's quite a challenge, actually. And to say there's one thing top of mind would probably not be fair to, to what the in, industry is actually interested in. Um, if you look at the events industry from a whole, depending on what kind of vertical you work in, whether that be brand and live events or festivals, there are some similarities in terms of technology. But for example, festivals are super interested in cashless and the information and the um, streamlining of the process that that can provide the attendee. Whereas the brands, what they're really super interested in is high brand exposure in a very short period of time possibly through things like augmented reality and gamifying the event and things like that. Um, and those statistics help them to provide, I suppose, a, a way and a means to justify what they've been doing in terms of spend at events. And, and then conferences are very much more about in the moment Q&A, audience engagement, as I see it. And then, you know, there's some things that just kind of interest the whole industry as we see it. Apps, believe it or not, are still up there. For the exhibition market, it's all about, and trade show market, it's all about matchmaking and meeting and spending quality time with quality people in those events. So it's, it's, really, um, it's really broad in terms of, I think, what's in the, the key event technology trends in the minds of people within the events industry. But is, um, is, event, is event tech kind of morphed into everything? It's like using a pencil to write. I mean, it's like not really its own thing anymore, but it's just an enabling tool for everything. So it's interesting you say that because I think like 10 plus, maybe 15 plus years ago, event technology was AV, right? Audio, visual, LED, that kind of stuff. That's, that's what event technology was. And it seems that the industry's adopted this terminology to kind of almost blanket everything that plugs in or is software. Um, and there needs to be some differentiation. And that's one of the challenges we've got with Event Tech Live and the Event Technology Awards now, is how do we make sure that we differentiate and clearly um, educate the market on these different technologies? Because they're not all the same. They, they work totally differently. The outputs are totally different. 
So it's, it's a real challenge at the moment. Um, but EventSec Live is still at the core an event about any technology that can work for the events industry. But more so what's happening is that's getting, that's scooping up things like digital. So digital analytics, digital advertising and marketing, social, these, these other elements are now kind of falling under this banner of event technology as well as, as far as I'm concerned, as I see it. Yeah, in our tech issue last year, we, we framed it as a, a tech before, during, and after the event. And I'm wondering, just, that was a, a framing issue, but I'm wondering, are, do you find that planners are thinking in that way, kind of holistically, how to integrate tech into their events, or is it just about um, finding the, the showpiece, you know, what, what is going to be the, oh, let's use AR or something like that, just finding the one thing that they're going to show off, or is it more of a holistic look at, at tech? I think it depends on who you're, who you're speaking to within that event organization. So for me, what's really interesting is the suite of CRM, sales-led project management tools that are coming specifically out for the events industry. Um, there's one that out there called We, uh, we Track that is meant for project management and has been used on Expo 2020 and large international air shows and horse racing events and things like that. So these mega events are, are thinking from a project management about, about um, technology from a 365 day approach, you know, what technology is going to underpin our event operations. But then when you get to marketing, they're looking at engagements. So they're look, looking at really up, leading up to the event, amplifying the event and, and post event, like you, like you rightly said. Um, anybody in sales is looking at what technology can make me money and what can I sell to sponsors. So that's more during the event and things like that. So it really depends on kind of what level you're talking at. And, and that's one of the things that we found about Event Tech Live. The, the demographic of the audience is, is quite broad. Um, they all have an interest in technology. They all have some kind of decision-making process within their remit. But actually, you know, we've got event marketers, we've got production managers. We're even seeing an, a growth in people just now with the title of event technology director. More CTOs come into the show from, from, a, from an operational point of view, but still with a technology slant. So I think it really depends on who you're talking to within the, within the food chain of, of organizing the event. In, the, in that food chain, uh, are you seeing the event directors actually engaging and wanting to be curious about this, or are they leaving it to other people? Are they actually sort of using, saying, okay, i got to figure out a better way to do this? Yeah, I, I do think they are taking more of a keen up, uh, interest because you've got to remember who, who, what those people are. They're, they're generally in charge of making money and saving money, right? So they're there from a financial perspective and an operational perspective. So in order for them to understand what's really going to make a difference from their whole organizational vision, and these guys are the guys that know what their vision is for their event business in 5, 10, 15 years, then technology decisions aren't ones in some cases that can be made on a year-to-year -year basis, you know, yes, you could change an event app supplier. Yes, you could change a registration company. But some of these other technologies that really need to be implemented long term, the only guys that, or the only guys and girls that can do that, are the ones that are at the top. So they need to kind of educate themselves. So when their teams are coming to them and say, "I need this new piece of technology, and it's going to cost us 20k over here," they're, they're educated enough to be able to have their opinion on it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're not just for the tech geeks, is what you're trying to tell us. You're also for the, the money people. I, I suppose we're, we're, we're for everyone. We, we want to try and provide an inclusive event. That's one of the reasons we have, for the course of the two days, we have five stages of content for two days. You know, we have everything from startups, so the brand new things coming into the, into the sector, the, the new technologies, the new suppliers, right through to, you know, high level, wider gamut looking at the industry technologies and speakers and things like that. I mean, I'm a geek at heart. I'm a first early adopter. I want the latest iPhone. I've got a reservation in from Tesla Model 3, do you know what I mean? So I'm a geek. So 
in, in terms of our community, there is a core of that. Don't get me wrong. And I think if you talk to our suppliers, they all kind of, you know, see themselves as, as geeks. Um, but we, we like to think we're providing a, a fair platform for everybody to kind of not feel and come feel alienated because technology can be quite alienating. You know, it can be daunting to some people and like, I just don't understand chatbots and AI and blockchain. And, you know, we need to, we need to be able to talk to everybody on a fair playing field without, you know, just talking all this, all the, all the, you know, the buzzwords, shall we say, and losing people and them not walking away with anything. Now let's take a quick break and listen to a message from one of our fantastic sponsors, Leo Events. Planning an event and wondering how to ensure your attendees will have the best experience possible? Let Leo Events, an award-winning global events agency, help you create a spectacular meeting or event that will leave your guests cheering and wishing for more. When you're ready to follow the roar everyone is talking about, go to leoevents.com. That's leoevents.com. Where, where do you see the center of gravity now in terms of innovation? I mean, of course, we're so U.S. central that we think everything in the U.S. is perfect, but you have more of a global perspective. Where, yeah. where are the good ideas and the great technology coming from now? And, and the, sort of the superstars, because technology is not just technical, it's art. Yeah. So I think the innovation is coming from great examples where I'm seeing technology companies being formed by people that have been in the thick of the action, Right. So they understand from the ground up the challenges that have faced them through delivering events. I mentioned earlier WeTrack. That was from a company who worked on and delivered the Olympics here in the UK when it was on. So that technology has been developed out of problems and frustration that have happened to individuals while delivering events. Um, Hub is another one. Ali Megar is, is a fantastic example of a technology that's been born out of frustration and an opportunity, a, a, a vision to be able to see what can be done better by harnessing technology. And those guys have gone out and educated themselves on technology, found the right team, found the right developers, and are now curating very, very seamless technology that just works specifically for, for that challenge. You know, it's interesting, the first uh, wave of these technologists were all people that went to a wedding and said, oh my God, I'm going to do it better. And if you notice, all of those big first wave of people raised a ton of money and yeah. didn't really understand the business. No. Yeah. And it's sense? interesting. Yeah. And, it, and, it, and, I, and what I'm really loving is I, I'm coming across or being pitched and, and sent information on technologies that you just wouldn't have thought about before. So one of the recent ones... I can't name who, who this organization is because they've got a plan to kind of really hit the market. But in the trade show and exhibition market, you know, one of the biggest things that, that takes up manpower and time, especially on large trade shows, is marking out all those stands, right? You know, somebody's got to go around and make sure everything's millimeter perfect, so everything fits in and is regulated to health and safety. That can take a lot of time up, a lot of manpower, costs a lot of money. Companies, okay, let me translate, let me translate you. Um, a, a, a stand is a booth. Yep, that's right. <laughs> and a millimeter is a square foot or a, or, or right, yeah. it's a different, let's translate for our <laughs> So, trade show, booth, square, feet, whatever. <laughs> but this company has seen an opportunity to use a, ro a robot and LiDAR and 3D mapping to be able to mark out a trade show overnight and just reduce down the amount of time. You know, it's dead time overnight, little cost, robot gets programmed, off it goes, marks out all the trade show booths, organizer turns in up in the morning, and it's all done for them. So what does that do in our world? Uh, how are unions reacting to that? You probably don't have this experience, but it's, it would be very we hard don't. Yes, to we don't. have that happen. We don't have unions here in the UK, and and, the more I, I look into and research the trade show market in the US, um, I think they're going to react a little bit like taxi drivers did with Uber, right? You know, they don't want it. it at the end of the day, and I, I don't want to see any technology putting people out of work. I don't think any, any of us want that. But at the end of the day, 
technology does change the way that we operate and we deliver anything in our lives. Um, I, I think they're going to be resistant to it, um, but I would, I would, I don't think they're going to be able to fully stop it. If that's what you're asking. Oh, I totally, I totally agree. I think that the even the sort of the new integrations between you have all these audio, audio AV people that are sitting there doing all this this detail work, but you can do it now with one program, and you don't need all the people behind the scenes anymore. Yeah, you're exactly right. I've just seen a, a technology platform software come out that's replaced essentially a full suite of people to manage live VTs and live streaming of content and sending it to TV broadcasters, which would have before needed, you know, half a dozen people and a full big setup. And now one guy can do it from his living room, not being, not even be at the event from his laptop and two screens. So who, I mean, gets, the, who gets the cost savings in that point? Is it the, the AV company? Do they pass it on to the show organizer? Uh, what, what happens there? It's an interesting one. I think I'd like to see it filter down. So, you know, supplier is saving organizer money, organizer passes those saving on, savings on to maybe attendees and things like that. Or maybe the organizer just lines their pockets a little bit more. I'm not sure. It depends on, on who you may ask. But, you know, events are astronomically expensive in some cases to put on, right? Um, and I think that we've seen that in the price of, tickets to events and things like that. And I'd hope to see that those cost savings filter down to actual attendees and they're the ones that ultimately benefit from being able to attend more events because it's more cost effective. Do you see that the attendees now are willing to pay more for events because they're so important or is there resistance at that level? Well, again, I think this looks at, I think this tends to be where you look within the world, right? So I've noticed that it's quite a regular thing in the US market for an exhibitor to pay to exhibit, for the educational content stream to be a paid for access, you know, could be $1,500, $2,000 for three days of content or something like that. Whereas in the UK, that's unheard of, really. There are some outlying events that have content streams that are paid for, but generally if it's a trade show and exhibition, it's free to attend full, you know, events at lives like that. You know, nobody pays for access to content. Nobody pays to attend the event. It's all supported through sponsorship and exhi exhibitors. Is that a global phenomenon other than the U.S., or is that just uh, just you, you, the way you're seeing it from a U.S. from our perspective? I'm, I, I will be honest and say that I've not delved into it much more than comparing the U.S. market to the European market. Um, my own experience of going over to places like um, Asia and Taiwan and things like that, they tend to be very much of the free to access events. Here in the UK, when you do have standalone conferences and things like that, yes, they are, they are paid for. But I do think the US market has a much higher ticket price than, than here in the UK as well as a, across the board. So, but maybe that's because to deliver events, you have things like unions and all that kind of stuff, which just adds that layer of extra cost on to delivering an event. We're going to take a little break and come right back after this message from Hilton. So when's the big event? Hilton's here for planners with their exclusive customized meetings. Become a wow maker and save time by letting Hilton help you present an extraordinary event, one that leads to memorable and meaningful connections. Visit meetings.hilton.com and let Hilton help you. So moving back to tech, we talked about project management a little earlier and mm -hmm. um, it's a spectrum in terms of, of where planners are with that. We, uh, we had a piece in Bizbash last week about uh, uh, encouraging planners to throw out the three ring binder because you do have people who are still working out of that. You, and then you have people who are maybe using Excel spreadsheets or Google Docs, so they may or may not be in the cloud. And then you have people who fully adopted these event management platforms. Um, and I'm wondering, have you ever looked at adoption rates among planners? Like, do you have a sense of, of how many people are working at the most advanced levels? Yeah, sure. I mean, we, we've seen a trend over the five years that we've delivered Event Tech Live from the kind of what people and what technologies they say they are fundamentally using. 
Uh, you know, I can remember five years ago when we asked the budget question, do you have a budget for event technology? It was like, nobody said yes. Do you know what I mean? Nobody had set budgets at that point to, to do technology. And now, you know, we've just opened registration for Event Tech Live. And those budgets for event technology are considerable. And we're asking, you know, are you going to increase budget? Are you, what, where are you looking to invest that budget? And more often than not, it's either sales and CRM or it's operational technology. And, you know, you're right in what you're saying about, you know, there's still event planners using, you know, Excel. That's fine. But, let, you know, rightly so, let's move that into the cloud because, you know, moving that into something like Google, which is pretty, relatively low cost, if not free, can still harness, you know, you can still do a call for speakers using Google Forms. You can put that information into Google Sheets. You can cross-reference that with analytical data from your website. And this, that Google's, Google is a powerful system. But the problem is we're not in a world where there's the education out there still to really understand how the events industry can help harness a tool like that. Yeah. Um, you know, even, even when you're um, on Google and you're part of their, their suite of technologies, you know, you've got task management and things like that in there now. And there's so many additional kind of add-ons and other technologies you can bolt into that. It makes it super easy. Is there anybody that has sort of cracked the code on the Google Doc, Google Doc, Google Drive thing in terms of here are the formats, this is the workflow process that people should be using? Because it seems to me that everyone is trying to reinvent it over and over and over again. Yeah. Where can we steal the right format? <laughs> <laughs> it's an interesting one. I, I've been talking to um, one of my colleagues here in the UK, or a client, should I say, uh, very recently about trying to put that in, put this in some form of content. So you, you know, you start off at the basic levels and then create a cheat sheet and a how-to of the more complex as you go down. There's there's more information to. I don't know. Maybe you just want to reg register something for somebody, and it's a dinner party, and it's twenty five people. Google Forms can do that. Yeah. And then what do you do with that data afterwards? But it is something that we're, we're hopefully going to work on over the next couple of years in kind of creating content of these free tools that you can use. And integrations is such a key part in that. You know, yes, Google works fantastically, but if you're using a CRM system over here, you might need them to talk to each other. So how would you bridge the gap if you're not a developer? And that's the key. It's understanding how that, that bridge. So my sort of sense of technology that I use as my sort of guide is uh, someone told me that the purpose of technology is to make what was complex trivial. Has, yes. has anyone ever, is anyone doing that on the event management side, on the overall holistic, I'm running an event and here are all the pieces and this is the, this is sort of the, the this is the, the easiest way to run an event. Is there, I mean, you're, you've seen it all. You have many children, so I know you can't sort of like bring one out against another. But things like, does Bizabo work compared to something else? I mean, we're journalists here, so we can talk about all this stuff on a, yeah. on, on yeah. a sort of a, awesome. connected to it. But is there something that, that you would tell the people that are listening that these guys got, have got it right? No. <laughs> but that's, but that's, that in itself says a lot. Yeah, I don't think there is the unicorn. I don't think there is a one platform that fits all, that fits all sizes, that can do everything. There is no Swiss Army knife of event tech. That's a good purpose. What about by the by the by the different divisions, by the festivals or by the meetings? So yeah, I mean, visible in the meetings, conference, live event space is fantastic. You know, you can. You can have your event up and running and take registrations and payments and all this kind of stuff like within hours. You know, I've seen it. I've seen the company develop on it. Um, you know, a lot of technology is actually like that. The key to it is is really for the event organizer or event planner to really sit down and understand what they want to achieve. If they just need to sell tickets for a conference, then there is a huge amount of platforms out there. If they need to start getting a little bit more technical and start to think, right, I've got an audience that I need to make sure that they meet and they get value out of it because I have 20,000 attendees and nobody can meet 20,000 people over three days. You know, you need to really nail that down. They need to start thinking a little bit more complex and that might not be visible as a system. That might be another system 
that can do all that as well. Or it might be a bot on an integration with something like Umbrella platform or something like that. So there's, there's no one size fits all. There are some fantastic companies out there doing some fantastic work and constantly innovating with their platforms. But I think it really starts down as who are you, who are you, what do you need your systems to do, what, what are your pain points, and then you need to go into the market. What, what I'd really like to see is individuals really realize there's actually a business model to be a consultant in this field. You know, event planners haven't got the time to sit down and look at 300 different technology suites and have demos from all of these guys and, you know, then try and figure out, does that work with my business and does that work with GDPR and all this kind of stuff? Actually, it's kind of like the agency format with brands needs to come into play with technology. There needs to be individuals who kind of have a very, very wide view of event technology, understands the event space and then can analytically look at what, is best suited for that particular are you, saying, are you saying that that is a need in the market that you see yeah. as a major move? Ab absolutely need in the, in, the, in the market. You know, we, we, we have consultants for everything else, right? We have accountants, financial consultants. We have, you know, insurance brokers and, and mortgage brokers and all these kind of things. Their, their job is to look at a wide market and figure out what particularly works for you. So, so here's my question. I'm, 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 I'm a skeptical person about to hire a consultant. How do I know the person knows what the hell they're talking about? Because you can't really, it's the Wild West out there. Well, it's history, isn't it? It's, it's you know, what proof do you know that you know how events work? You know, what's your experience within the events industry? What's your experience, maybe just within my field of events, let's say exhibitions or, or festivals? You know, who else have you helped? What, what credibility have you got in maybe being published and, and, and offering advice out there to the industry? I think it comes through recommendation as well. You know, I can recommend this person to help you with your problem. Um, and you need to be independent from the technology supplier because we have a lot of information and push from, from technology suppliers about the best way to do these things which in their context of their products, yeah, of course, that's the best way to get, you know, Visible is going to be the best to deliver your technology for your event because we can do it in this way. But there needs to be some independence there. And I get offered quite regularly, oh, Adam, if you can recommend us, I'll put us in touch with this company, I'll give you 20% and referral fees. And, and I turn it down flat. I'm like, if I recommend you, I want to recommend you off the merits of you guys. Okay, not so that, is that an Adam rule? That's an Adam rule, yeah. Independence is the key. So anybody listening to this that's about to hire a consultant have to know that they're not affiliated with a particular point of view. Exactly. Or they get paid for it. By yeah. And even when I do make my recommendations, if they're a customer of Event Industry News or a customer of Event Tech Live, I make sure that the person um, that I'm recommending to, which generally comes from an approach from them, it, it's made very well. These are an exhibitor. These are not an exhibitor. These might be an advertiser. So that's always cleared up during the, the instances of those conversations as well. So as we talk about the need, perhaps for this uh, type of consultant, this new um, role that I'm sure there are many people who are qualified to fill. Um, but you made the point when we were talking uh, before we started recording that even the big players are still trying to figure this out. So tell us more about that. Maybe reassure some listeners who, um, who are feeling like they don't have it figured out, uh, that they're not alone. Okay. So my example is this, and I'll, I'll give you one that happened at um, Event Tech Live last year, I think it was. Um, we had probably the best part of nearly 10 individuals come from Barclays Bank to Event Tech Live at multiple different levels, you know, event marketer, CTO, director of events, things like that. You know, as a big company, they've got a lot of money and a lot of people to figure this out. I'm sure they've got analysts for technology within their organization, but they're still coming to an event like Event Tech Live. And they weren't there for the drinks and the cookies because the cookies aren't that great, to be honest with you. But they were there as, as an organization to look at what was happening within this space and what they might use for their events. And, you know, I think if, if Event Tech Live is a reflection of just the 
smaller to medium sized planner trying to figure it out, we wouldn't have the brands and the organizations come and, and people within those higher levels come into Event Tech Live because they would have got it figured out, right? And all we'd do, as David alluded to earlier, is we'd copy what they were doing because they'd have figured it out and we'd just go, oh, well, they're an exhibition, I'll just use everything that they're using. So well, yeah. that's not happening. You're 100% right. I mean, you, I'm, I'm so surprised that the big guys are looking at the little guys. Yeah, uh, where there can where how they can be more nimble, and uh, so some of the more innovative smaller companies are really where the action is. Yeah, and I think I think they're also interested because I think they understand that there is an element of competitive advantage. You know, if they can nail this technology piece right for their events, if they can get more streamlined, more revenue, you know, just just a few days ahead of an event plan than normal, then they're in a better position than possibly their competition that's not using any of that to get them through to the event. So they're, they're still figuring it out, trust me. And, and, and off the record, I've been sat in front of these guys and like huge corporations within the event space inviting me in to do a presentation with their team from around the world on what they need to be looking at. So. That's, that's, off, that's off the record. That's off the record on the podcast. I won't name I won't name who most recently, but you know, companies that I look up up to and I think these guys know how to run events. They they've got events all around the world in, in you know in gas and oil and pharma and things like that. And you think, surely these guys have got it figured out. They've got CTOs and directors of technology. And they're still kind of like, mm, we've not figured it out. Well, are there, are there specific areas that people are finding particularly intimidating right now? I think some of the event management, maybe they're using something and they just need to get to the next level. They're willing to investigate that final solution and move on. But are there areas where everybody's kind of looking around? Is it blockchain? Is it you know, maybe a, a term that maybe people have heard but, but don't know? What, what is really intimidating people right now? I think there are, yeah, there are some of these things that uh, you, you mentioned blockchain at the other day. You know, what does that mean for the registration and ticketing system? Is it security and all that kind of stuff? Se security technology is actually another one. You know, um, here in Manchester, we recently had high profile attacks on, on a concerts and things like that. So now those organizations are trying to kind of look at other areas like airports and LIDAR and things like that to be able to track people around venues. And that's, that's quite challenging. I think that most things that it's not necessarily the technology. It's twofold. It's one, it's the time is taking the time to understand those technologies and how it may impact your event. And then it's kind of like, how do I take the time to implement that? Because um, we're in events, you know, we're from day to day, we're running, you know, most of event organizers are not just running, running one annual event, they may be doing a dozen or more. So they're not really sat down and still, and they don't really have time off to kind of go, okay, let's look at all this. Let's, let's investigate blockchain and let's figure out what it means for our event. That layered on top of there is so much noise in the event technology space at the moment with companies telling you they've got the best thing since sliced bread to fix all your problems. It's hard to kind of cut through that. Can you do, can you, uh, one thing that we always throw the term blockchain around, 99% of the people in our industry don't have a clue what it really is. How I, wouldn't even, I, I wouldn't even worry about it. <laughs> yeah, so the thing is, though, we've got to be careful that it is a it is a it is a uh, a way to create uh, dispersed information, but it's something that is not going to necessarily be something that will be top of mind for our industry for a long time to come. No, I think it will be. You know, blockchain has huge applications outside of the events industry, and that's why it's grabbing the headlines. And people always look at you know the global scale don't they? They don't just look at the events industry and what's happening within technology. Um, a blockchain will become as ubiquitous as everybody holding an iPhone or a Samsung. It just will happen. Behind the scenes though. Yeah. I, I just don't think people should worry themselves about, you know, the higher levels of things like artificial intelligence and blockchain and, you know, encrypted security and things like that because there's things that are much closer to them that can make such a big difference to their event business like 
project management tools, you know, dealing with multiple suppliers, making sure information's not duplicated or is in the right format and mistakes aren't made and mistakes cost money. At the end of the day, the events industry charges for time. That's how we make our money. So there's, if we've maxed out our time, there's no more revenue unless we take more people on. What we need to do is we need to maximize the time that those people have in order to grow, as I see it. Well, I would challenge you a little bit. One of the things that, that people should be focusing on a little bit is the ex- uh, technology to improve the experience. Uh, and with things like IoT uh, that are connected devices that can improve the experience. You know, will we see smart chairs and smart tables and, and <laughs> that, that are going to make it so that you'll be able to deliver products at an event on a personalized basis? But personalization is the big buzzword. How do you get there without using technology? You have to use technology. You do, but you, you also have to quantify and, and, and look at your demographic of your audience, right? So let's take an event like the Cake and Bake Show here in the UK. If you had IoT-enabled chairs and all this technology going on, you would probably alienate somewhat the audience because they're not necessarily within that realm of being familiar with that type of technology and stuff like that. You maybe move that to um, an eSports event or, or, or even just a general sporting event like football or something like that. The demographic of the audience is going to be much more open to using those, those technologies. So yes, technology can engage the audience and it, it will get better and more involved as time goes on. But that will happen as we become more familiar with technology. It's kind of like if you took an iPhone now back 10 years, people oh, would yeah. think it was, it was alien. Yeah. And this is why things like, you know, for me, Google Glasses and things like that haven't really caught on yet because we're still so far away from being comfortable with that type of technology. I'm, I'm a futurist. I think we'll have augmentations and, you know, as we get older, things like eyes will get replaced because, you know, you'll be able to have HD and, you know, all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm, I'm a proper futurist like that. And I think we could eat all augmenters. But if anybody was to do that right now, they would be seen as such an outlier. So I think, I think engagement technologies are... A, you know, one of the best engagement technologies I've seen at the moment is AR, augmented reality, used at live events to encourage the participants to engage, get rewarded. That might be a, a beer company or a spirit company giving away free drinks to kind of engage with other attendees. And, and that's what people are there for, right? At any event, they're there to get, engage with other attendees. If there's a bit of technology like AR that can kind of facilitate that, and everybody walks away super happy. Yeah, well, I believe that we're about to launch our magazine with AR uh, in the next yeah. two weeks. Very and nice. The magazine is a perfect use case for yeah. augmented reality. And I think that when you see speaker programs and staging and things like that, you're going to see AR all over the place. And the cost is pretty reasonable right now. Really? I've, like, been so, I've been so far out of the print game for so long now, I've lost touch with it. But <laughs> this is, uh, you're, you know, you're going to... Be a, you're going to be on a stage, you're going to have a speaker on a stage and right around him will be all the intro information on him when you hold up your phone. If you're holding up the phone anyway for the photograph. Yeah, no, I think, I think, I think, we'll, be, I think we'll become so used to using that device to contextualize extra layer information over what, what we're seeing. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, I, I do see that very much. In context of fashion shows, even, we've covered AR fashion shows, so you're holding it up and you're getting buying information where you can buy on the spot. Yeah. So, it's, it's already happening. The key, I think, is concerts and stuff like that. You know, I love this band. I've just seen them. I want to go, get their track, click on a link that's straight into iTunes. Bob's your uncle. That's, a, that's engagement. Not, right. not impressions, not what social media spouts offers. Engagement, which is you, you, your picture's being seen a thousand times. We're a scrolling generation now. We, we don't see things. We scroll past things. So that's not real engagement. You know, that's engagement where you've just talked about there where it, it takes an action. From a digital perspective, though, I want to sort of see if you, this is my premise that we're kind of in a post-digital age because we're a little bit over the idea that you can, like what you just said, we're scrolling past things. Mm. So, you, so that's why I think the world is changing. It's not just about the, the, the silver, you know, the silver bullet or the, or the shiny objects. No, no. I think the problem sometimes is that we're 
by nature, humans are quite the hoarders. So let's take Instagram. We, we follow all these hundreds and hundreds of accounts because it has some relevance to something that we're interested in. Let's say fitness or Porsche cars or and I'm talking from my own experience here. Um, ketogenic dieting and all that kind of stuff. You know, we, we, we collect, we follow all these things, but then what we have is we have a massive information that we can't digest quick enough. So that's where the scrolling and the tweet lines and, you know, then you, all of that is competing with, with all of that time. You know, YouTube's competing with your time. Instagram is, Twitter is, Facebook is, emails are, WhatsApp and text messages. So there's just so much information. What actually is more um, forgiving is if you kind of do a spring clean on all that, go through it and clean some of that stuff out. You get a much better experience from it. Are there other guest-facing technologies? We spent a lot of time talking about the, the project management, internal stuff, um, uh, but we started to get into this with AR. Tell us about another guest-facing technology where you are starting to see a lot of innovation or you think is poised to be the next thing. So I think one of the things that could be ubiquitous across the events industry is a chatbot for every event and every event organization. I think... You know, it, it kind of comes back to Google where we're, we're so used to hitting in a search term and getting results. And, and that quick, you know, one sentence, give me, give me a list of things that are relevant to this contextual thing that I've put in there. And I, I've learned over the years of organizing Event Tech Live, the same questions come up over and over and over and over again. But what chatbots also offer us is a way to better understand the audience and offer them personalization which is what we want right so it takes google one step further and rather than giving you 15 pages of results it goes david we already know that you like this so here's the results that matter to you i think chatbots can offer that you know i'm already seeing the ability through chatbots to you know see what sessions are relevant to you see what attendees are relevant to you um, even engage with speakers and things like that through chatbots and stuff, and, and just get that information. That, that, for me, is something we'll be using on Event Tech Live this year in a very, very beta stage, but I could see being just one of those things that we, we rely on so much to have that communication. And the benefit about a chatbot is it never switches off. There is no maximum capacity to a chatbot. If you've got one person using it, that's fine. If you've got 20,000 people using it at 1 a.m. on a Saturday, you know, that's fine as well. It's switched on. It's always there to serve. And, and anything technology that's customer service centric, I think it's going to do really, really well in the event space. How do you see the intersection between the event app and the chatbot? Do you think that they're going to morph together or do you think that, uh, that you need both? I think there's a possibility for the chatbot to replace the event app. Um, I really do, you know, um, mobile optimized, websites, content delivery is becoming so much better now. Right. Um, and the, the general use of a, an event app is to kind of, I'm going to alienate so many of my customers right now, but <laughs> um, it is to give us information based on the fact that we're at an event, right? So, you know, sessions, speakers, other attendees, oh, where, where's lunch, that, all that kind of information that we need. But if we had an event tech live chatbot that's got all that information in the background, but you just ask it and get the information that you want, that makes it super relevant. So I think, I think there's a potential there. I'm not saying it will 100%. There will still probably be some instances where people want that control. But chatbots just, just offer a much more compelling story, I think. So do you think, I mean, there's all this money that's been spent on event apps, do you just think those companies are, more, are going to sort of have to a, a, adapt to uh, and evolve? Yeah, sure. I mean, absolutely. That's, that's technology in a nutshell, though, isn't it? It's a constant evolution and change in the way that we, you know, we, we, we consume information. So, you know, again, if you I think it was, you know, if you, if you asked about years and years and years ago if the, the ringing telephone was ever going to be replaced people would be like well that's that's ridiculous we're never going to replace a, a telephone but it just morphs into something else and, and that's what you know that's what events apps are they're a they're a, they're a 
an evolution of previous technology and something that replaced that. You know, I'm, I'm talking more and more about registration via text message and, and chatbots. You know, these long film forms that we have to fill in to register for events, they're probably going to get replaced because are we going to go to there and do that or are we just going to go to a chatbot for an event and go, I'd like to register? Yeah, no problem. Go yeah. You're seeing now even the, the chatbot form of, of changing your passwords. Yeah. And, it, and it's like revolutionizing that frustration that you have when yeah. you go, oh, no, I forgot my password. It's just it's making it much easier. I've, I've even seen chatbots being used so much more for, for setting up technology and software because it makes it personalized and relevant to you. We can quickly estimate how, you know, te- how, how, familiar you are with that type of technology so it can take you through a slower process or a faster process and it's there constantly to you know say you need questions i have one more one more uh, sort of technology perspective question and that and i always believe that there's a whole thing on 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 information transfer when you go to a conference how do you get that information back to the people at your um at your home office like I now sit at an event and I am on Slack the entire time and I say, Beth, have we heard about this? Or mm-hmm. so that you're able to translate the information because the biggest issue I have is I forget everything that I hear and I don't transfer. I spend $3,000 on a conference and I don't get to transfer the information properly. Are there okay, any, so is anybody addressing this? Absolutely. 100%. 100%. So we've worked with a fantastic company that's not a new company to the sector. It's a company called Perkin. They're now owned by Global Event Specialist Solutions, yes. one of the two GES. All our attendees at Event Tech Live come outfitted with a smart badge. We outfit every exhibitor, every sponsor, every speaker, every session with a touch point. So you come to the event, David, you want to get information from that exhibitor, that exhibitor, you want a copy of the oh. session from that video, you want a recording of that speaker, you want the details of that person, that speaker, you've met somebody, you exchange information with them, that can all be delivered to your post-show and then you can share it with the rest of the team. But it's personalized to you because it's only the information that you're collecting that you find of interest and relevance to you. And Pokemon has done a fantastic job for us. In 2017, last year, through 1,700 attendees or 1,800 attendees, that through that one system, there were 10,000 pieces of information exchanged. So that's, that's a lot. So I want to end with this one. Um, what is the difference between events in, in, in UK, London, and US? What do you think <laughs> the biggest difference is? Why are our events better than your events? Why, why are your events better? <laughs> Ooh, good, good question. <laughs> You know what I think it is? I think it's a little bit of a market. I think it may be a bit more, what's the word that I want to use? It's kind of like personality, but it's, it's unique to kind of groups of people. So the UK is very reserved, right? We, we kind of like to be all prim and proper and we don't really approach other people just out of, you know, we don't get chatting to people in queues and things like that. And I think that's what makes events different in the US is the US attendee is so much more open to just talking to anybody, engaging with everybody, getting the most value out of the people that are in the room. So you, and I may be totally wrong here, so I am going to say that, but I think, I think, I think you, the US is so much more outgoing that, it, that you glean so much more back from attending events, whereas in some ways people in the UK attend events very passively. They go there, they look at content, and they don't engage with anybody around them. Well, that's, that's insane. That's it. But, you know, there's a perception that I have that in the UK, people take events more seriously. And they think about the, the, the look and feel more and the sort of the, sort of the whole, whole feeling of an event, where in, in the US, it's a little bit more rock and roll. And you have, the, you have really great events and you have really terrible events where this is purely my perception and it has nothing to do with fact <laughs> uh, that that it's a little bit more more thought out in the uk maybe so we maybe have to do, we might have to look into that a little bit more together actually i don't think that i don't think i'm right but that's my perception you guys yeah. are cooler and you're gonna be more creative 
but maybe yeah. not. Adam, I just want to say thanks so much for bringing your perspective to Gather Geeks. We really appreciate the conversation and insight. Um, and let's end by having you tell our listeners how they can reach you and learn more about what you do. And attend Event Tech Live. Okay, so um, Event Tech Live is on the 7th and 8th of November. Um, we have attendees from all around the world. Last year, 47 countries. Registration is free. You can go to eventtechlive.com. And if you can't make it, content will be made available to anybody that wants to digest that post show. Um, you can personally follow me at Punchtown Parry. That's my own personal Twitter handle. I will say I post lots of dog pictures, so be warned. And if you want to kind of check out our other stuff, then all my links to all my other you know, events and media are on there as well. All right, we're back in our studio. David, Adam said there's no Swiss Army knife of event tech. Do you think that's coming or will different companies continue to excel in their lanes? I think it's going to be their lanes. I really do. I Every time you hear about the silver bullet, it doesn't seem to happen. We've been talking about event ROI for 20 years, at least I have, and no one has cracked the code on that yet. So I'm looking forward to... Uh, I don't think that we're going to be satisfied with it all working perfectly anytime soon. Adam also named the chatbot as the guest-facing technology that's really poised to take off. We've experimented with that yes. at BizBash for more than a year now. Uh, do you agree with him? I do agree with him. I think that uh, people don't want to learn new things. And that if you can integrate what's really live, what, what's happening in your own phone, in your own life, it's going to be easier. But but getting smarter on the other end, getting the AI aspects of the chatbot so it can answer thousands of questions and get smarter. Right. That's something we've seen in the iterations that we've done for our, our BizBash Live events. It has changed and adapted uh, from show to show for over this past year. Uh, it's very interesting. So, Beth, what's going on at BizBash? Well, our fall issue is out. We are thrilled. Yay. I know. We're thrilled to finally have this out in the world. This is a print magazine, our first regular issue in print since 2016. And uh, David, you alluded to this in our discussion with Adam, but this issue has a tech twist, so really appropriate for me to be talking about on this episode. It's AR enabled, which means that after you download the BizBash AR app, you can experience our issue in augmented reality. Uh, beyond that, though, the issue is full of ideas, inspiration, and strategy that our readers have you know, come to expect in BizBash. This issue in particular has our list of the top 500 people in events and our 2018 holiday party guide. So it's chock full. Our subscribers should have already received it or will soon, and everyone else can find it digitally at bizbash.com slash fall 2018. Great, 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 Beth. Um, we want to, before we end, I want to thank all the people that helped bring this uh, edition together as usual. Claire Hoffman, who is our editor in, on our West Coast, on the West Coast of the United States, who uh, helped us on the content. Uh, Dave Nelson, who is our producer, and Rebecca Pappas, who is the person that got it out to, to the distribution channels. So thank everybody for coming and, and hopefully you enjoyed it. And also, we would love you to make a comment uh, that will help us and help other people discover our podcast. So go to the whatever your commenting uh, vehicle is and whatever service you're using and, and let us know how you like the podcast. Right. Le yeah, leave us a review. Uh, send us a comment. It'll help with discoverability and get Gather Geeks out to, to everyone. Yep. So now what do we say, Beth? Gather on, David. Gather on, Beth. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, Google Play, and Pocket Cast. Be sure to leave us a rating and review. It helps others discover the Gather Geeks podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can leave feedback on Twitter at Gather Geeks or leave us an email, gathergeeks at bizbash.com. We hope you join us again for the next episode of Gather Geeks. Until then, gather on. Gather Geeks is sponsored by Leo Events. Need help executing a one-of-a-kind experience that will leave attendees wishing for more? Leo Events is an award-winning global events agency that excels in exceeding clients' expectations and creating remarkable moments. When you're ready to follow the roar, visit leoevents.com.